Good morning, Dr. Pickles. Uh, in a moment or two, uh, Mary will invite you to take the affirmation. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, let me describe uh, the scene for you. Uh, you see a, a number of people here in the, the hearing room, uh, a mixture of lawyers over to your left uh, and uh, the uh, interested public and participants in front of you. Uh, you are talking to a much wider audience, little number in three figures, uh, out there who are watching either on YouTube or on live stream. So that's your audience. Ms. Richards will ask you the questions in a moment. Uh, Mary. Please state your full name. Dr. Hilary Glenn Pickles. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. <clears throat> Dr. Pickles, can I start with an overview of your career? Yes. You qualified in medicine in the early 1970s, is that mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you, I'm afraid nodding doesn't get picked up on the transcript. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and, and then, um, after some uh, hospital-based general clinical medical practice, you undertook pharmacology research uh, and obtained a PhD in 1978. Um, yes. Um, you, you told us in your statement you then undertook training in clinical pharmacology. What was the nature of that training? Um, it was an MRC training fellowship, so I was doing mostly research, but... Um, I started initially at the National Hospital, Queen Square, um, and the clinical element of that related to uh, epilepsy patients. I then went on to St. Thomas's and was involved particularly with hypertension, but doing quite a lot of work with uh, normal volunteers and experimental use of drugs, um, as well as attending a variety of other training <coughs> sessions in clinical pharmacology. Uh, and then you told us mm. in your statement that you, um, your qualifications included a fellowship of the Faculty of Public Health. Yeah. When did you obtain that? Um, I obtained that after, well, I obtained membership of the Faculty of Public Health Medicine after I left the Department of Health. So I was never trained in public health. Um, I could have been given the membership of the, the faculty as a result of the position I, I had in the department. They were just developing the faculty at the time. I chose not to. I took it by examination. Um, after I had left um, the core department. So I'd, when I was on secondment, I started and finished it when I was uh, in Hillington. So I took it by examination membership, and then that's converted to fellowship some years later. And we'll come back at a later stage of your evidence mm -hmm. a little more to um, your public health uh, work. You joined the Department of Health in 1982. Um, if we can just look at your witness statement um, and see the table you've set out there with your employment history... Lawrence, it's WITN 69650001, please. Uh, and then page eight. So if we look at the table at the yes. bottom of the page, uh, you started in the medicines division of the DHSS as senior medical officer. Mm -hmm. uh, in broad terms, can you tell us what the role was of the medicines division at that time? Uh, well, the medicines division essentially operated the uh, 1968 Medicines Act. Um, and when I started, I was in the new chemical entities division, so we were looking at applications for licensing uh, to put medicines on the, uh, the market in the UK uh, of new chemical entities um, and variations, uh, different um, uh, indications for an existing medicine. I then transferred over to deal with adverse reactions to existing medicines and in the context of this inquiry that's quite important that I, my training as a clinical pharmacologist and my experience in that bit of medicines division meant that I was very well aware of the adverse effects of um, treatment given uh, in the NHS uh, and indeed it was a, quite a concern of mine. Um, and b before we move on to your next role, you weren't part of 
the biological Not at all. That was a, a, a completely separate group, and uh, I was never part of that. So you weren't dealing with the licensing of blood products? Not at all, no. Uh, in relation to the adverse reactions part of your work, what, what in broad terms did, did that work involve? Um, we were looking at adverse reaction information from a variety of sources. Um, obviously, the companies were obliged to pass information to us that they had received. We had the yellow card reports. We had scientific literature. But principally, we were looking to see if the damage being done was so great that a product had to be withdrawn from the market or restricted in its use. So there were several products that I was involved with where I would you know, examine the case and, and basically present it to a subcommittee and then to the Committee of Safety and Medicines, and if necessary, appeal right up to the Medicines Commission to remove something from the market. And it, during that <coughs> period of your, your work involved with adverse reactions, were you involved directly with any consideration of adverse reactions from factor concentrate? Not at all, no. I think in the anything that was biological wasn't handled by even the adverse reactions section. They went straight to the biological experts. Um, then we can see in October 1984, you were promoted to principal medical officer for the Committee on the Review of Medicines. That's right. What was the work of that committee? Well, that committee was going through all the medicines that had been on the market before the, um, the Medicines Act came in. And um, it was difficult because the, many of them didn't have the sort of quality of evidence for staying on the market that was being demanded of new products. And many drug companies had withdrawn their less satisfactory products. And we were dealing with essentially the dregs, the remainder, um, sometimes small volume use, uh, sometimes um, quite... Uh, inappropriate use, uh, and there were some difficult areas like homeopathics and anthroposophic medicines that hadn't really ev evidence of efficacy. Uh, um, that was quite a, an interesting challenge. And would it be right to understand that that work didn't involve looking at any factor concentrates because they post-dated no, no. the Medicines Act? No. Um, if we go, sorry, no, still on this page, um, you then, in May 1986, transferred yes. to the AIDS yeah. unit, taking up the post of Principal Medical Officer in the AIDS unit. I'm going to come back to the AIDS unit in a little more detail. So okay. if we go over the page, please. We can then see, um, in March 1988, uh, you became Principal Medical yeah. Officer in Med SEB. Yeah. A, a role you retained until June of 1991. And again, I'll come back to that yes. in, in more detail um, because that, 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 that'll yeah, be the focus obviously. of the questions. Um, June 1991, you transferred to um, work with the uh, NHS Director of Research and Development. Uh, in, a, in a sentence, what, what did that entail? Uh, well, so Michael, Pe Michael Peckham has, was a new uh, appointment in the department. He was trying to, uh, and he wasn't working under the chief medical officer, he was in the permanent secretary's part of the uh, department, and was trying to encourage research relevant to the needs of the NHS and encourage adoption of uh, research findings within the NHS. Uh, and then we can see in October 93 to June 94, you were a principal medical officer within the branch dealing with acute medical services. Uh, and then you began... Um, if I can put it this way, a second or further phase of your career focused yes. on public yeah. health. Yeah. And we can see there you were seconded as an acting consultant in public health medicine to the Ealing, Hammersmith and Hounslow Health Authority. You then became director of public health at Hillingdon Health Authority. You then had a, just over a year as director of public health yeah, policy at yeah. PHLS. Yeah. That came to an end because PHLS... Yeah, between my appointment and arriving... They, uh, there was an announcement they were going to abolish the PHLS. So I, I stayed there till it's finished. And, uh, and then you returned again. to Hillingdon, which by now was a primary care trust rather than yeah, a health authority, yeah. and you remained there as director yes. of public health. Um, if I can just ask you a handful of questions about that public health work. Mm -hmm. um, how well developed or, or established was the concept of public health? by the 1990s? I think it was, it was pretty well um, developed then, yes. I mean, in a way, the success is the old medical officers of health, but I think the public health as a, as a discipline was uh, no, well established by then. 
what about the, in the 1970s and 1980s? Do you have any sense I, of, 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 of its role then? I think it was very much developing and it was, it was still very medical. And I think one thing that's interesting is when the Faculty of Public Health Medicine changed its name to the Faculty of Public Health. So it was in the sort of 90s that increasingly non-medical practitioners were coming in and being encouraged to uh, work in a senior, senior role. Um, and, and what in broad terms was the job of a director of public health? Well, it was, a, it was a board member, so it was part of a collegiate as, as a member of the board. But I say there's a slight correction, because actually it's Hillington Health Agency when I first turned up, because of yet more organisational change, but for practical purposes it, in Hillington, it was, the agency was the same as the subsequent health authority. Um, um, because in, in, in principle for the medical and professional advice to the health authority that was commissioning services for people, for the local population, um, writing an annual public health report, so like the chief medical officer writes a report, expected to report um, uh, every year, the various executive functions that were held by the director of, of public health in relation to communicable disease. We provided an on-call on function. I had Hillingdon, uh, I had uh, Heathrow Airport in Hillingdon, so I had quite a lot to do with um, the health control unit there and screening of immigrants, as well as quite an interest in emergency planning, obviously with uh, with Heathrow. So it was a, a mixture, and I have to say my colleagues in other health authorities may have had a slightly different mix. I also was medical director, so I had uh, a role in relation to. Uh, any employed medical staff, but also, which became great in the primary care trust in relation to uh, general practitioners, poorly performing GPs and so on. Um, now, whilst we still have the statement um, open, if we go to page 37, I think there's a small yes, correction you yes, wanted to make yes, to one paragraph yeah. of your statement. Yes, I should say that I did do the first draft of my statement. I know you've been asking some of the... It's 29.3. And um, so this is faulted entirely, entirely mine. Um, that uh, it wasn't until I was looking at it that I realised um, I got this wrong. Um, so we have beginning of the fourth line that he was dying a couple of weeks later of complication of prime, prime illness. It actually dying four months later. So um, for, for a couple of weeks, we should read four months. Please do. And it's my fault entirely. And we can take the statement down. Thank you, Lawrence. When you took up um, your first post at the Department of Health, and then as you, you changed to different posts, did, did you at any stage receive any training? <laughs> uh, I think new medical officers were supposed to have uh, it was a brief training of a couple of, couple of weeks or, or something for joining medical staff. I didn't get it, and uh, I was... I had... I had um, I don't think I ha had any training. I was all training on the job. Uh, that was slightly unusual, and I know one of my colleagues raised it at, a, 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 at a, a promotion interview that he hadn't had any training, and uh, he then had it about two after being in there for two years. Um, I had no no realistic induction at all. Actually, I was told this is these are the product license files. This is what you do. Get on and do it. Having said that, of course, my background was. You know, I was a, an expert in this. I was a background in, in basic pharmacology and in clinical pharmacology. I was very happy doing that sort of type paperwork, and I got into it very quickly. But when you then moved to different jobs, which didn't call upon your background uh, in clinical pharmacology, yeah, yeah. again, was it you learnt on the job? I'm afraid I did, and it was a real shock going to the AIDS unit because it was so radically different from anything I'd done before, way outside my comfort zone, and I just had to hit the ground running because there was so much that was going on. Um, people were very, very kind and supportive um, to me, um, but I you know, was not familiar with all the parliamentary process, the, the financial matters, and the need to consult so many people, so many interests across not just the, um, the department, but um, government as a whole. So I, I learned very quickly on the job. <laughs> Uh, in terms of evidence given to other inquiries or, yeah. or litigation, we'll, we'll come in due course to the HIV haemophilia litigation um, okay. and the extent of your involvement with that when you were uh, at the Department of Health. You gave written and oral evidence to the BSE inquiry. 
Yeah, I was the biggest witness for the Department of Health and uh, I think second only to the Chief Veterinary Officer in terms of the, the uh, amount of evidence I provided. Uh, and we'll, we'll, when we look at your time at the yeah. Department of Health, I'm not going to ask you about the detail of that, but we'll, we'll see how that, that, how that fitted in with other responsibilities. Um, were you ever approached to give evidence to the Archer inquiry? No. And then in relation to the Penrose inquiry, you've told us in your witness statement you provided a brief written answer in response to specific questions. Was that pursuant to um, what Dr. Raymond described to us as the warning letter procedure? Yes. Yeah, so I, it had all passed me by. I was aware it was going on, but I would, was deliberately not in, engaging in it. And then suddenly I got a letter to say, this is, this is an extract, this is what they say about it. I have to say I freaked out. And I, I was clearly, had been quite affected more than I realised by the BSE inquiry. And to receive this without even telling me there was support available to me or legal uh, advice uh, caused quite a reaction. But uh, when I then looked at it, actually it was a, a, a trivial and rather silly comment, so um, I dealt with it and did get legal advice. Um, and so you weren't asked during the course no, of the Penrose inquiry to provide a statement or oral evidence? No. Uh, um, can I then just uh, first of all take you back to your, your work <coughs> in the medicines division, very, yeah. very, very uh, relatively briefly. Um, which was the subcommittee that, that your work attached to? Um, the, the Safety, Efficacy and Adverse Reaction Subcommittee, at that time chaired by Mike Rawlins, who I think we'll be seeing later. We will, yes. <coughs> um, uh, and uh, as I understand your evidence, you'd, you'd attend all the subcommittee meetings. Yeah, we attend those meetings and speak to the papers we had prepared about the individual products, yes. Um, and then the subcommittee would reach its decision. Yes. Um, and then, is this right, every subcommittee decision would then be reviewed by the Committee on the Safety of Medicine? The Committee of Safety of Medicine would bring together from the Safety, Efficacy and Adverse Reaction Subcommittee what the Pharmaceutical Subcommittee had brought. So the, the, the quality aspects were brought together with the, um, the safety and efficacy together at the Committee of Safety of Medicines. And at that meeting, <coughs> the findings of the subcommittees would be um, reported by the chairs of these subcommittees, but we were often present to answer any specific questions because we knew the detail about the product. And can you recall um, uh, the extent to which the Committee on the Safety of Medicines, was it really just performing um, a, a review mechanism, looking at what the subcommittee had done and, and rubber, not quite, quite rubber stamping, but, but saying, yes, we think that's right, or was it a full investigation itself of the same uh, they, they had a very big workload and uh, I mean many of the cases were non-controversial at all and, and they would get a sense if they needed to um, bring something in but um, they were synthesizing a draft of two separate committees which may not necessarily uh, uh, said the same and there was often a very vigorous debate actually on, on those that were difficult um, and likewise on questions about products that had to be uh, uh, and modified, uh, their claims modified or whatever. Uh, there was also an appeal process, so companies would uh, uh, appear in front of the committee with various hearings. So in principle, there'd be nothing stopping the, the Committee on the Safety of Medicines from rigorously examining the reasoning of, of, of one of the subcommittees? Nothing other than actual, I was going to say the practicalities, I think the volume of paperwork was you know, very extensive and the time available was clearly limited. Um, uh, but in theory, they could and sometimes did. Um, and then I just want to ask you about uh, one meeting. It, it, it's more for the generality of the point because the issue itself was yeah. not one in which you had any involvement. Um, it's DHSC 00039471015. Um, Uh, and we can see this is a meeting from the 22nd of November, 1984. If we go just a tiny bit further down the list of attendees, please, Lawrence, we can see that you're there under the heading also present, yeah. um, Dr. Pickles. Yeah. Um, we can see the membership of the committee, and we'll, we'll see it includes <sighs> Professor Rawlins, who is, as you say, we'll be hearing from um, in, in due course. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you um, a general question, but, but based upon something said on the last page of this document. So um, this is uh, any other business aids... And if we can just have that whole paragraph on, thank you. So we can see Dr. Smith, so that's Dr. Joseph Smith, yes. informed the yep. committee that heat treatment of factor eight, um, abolished detectable infectivity of AIDS virus uh, added to the preparation. Companies should be encouraged to apply for variations and so on. And then we see Professor Rawlins reminding the committee that heat treated factor eight is more expensive than the standard preparation. Widespread substitution of the heat treated product may cause haemophilia yeah. centres to exceed their budgets. Now, I can, I, I'm not asking about the detail of that comment. I can ask Professor yes. Rawlins uh, yeah, about that. Do. My question is a more general one. What, what, if any, role did issues of costs have in the work of either the subcommittees or the CSM? It should have had no, uh, no concern at all, neither cost or need. And, uh, indeed, that, there was a lot of discussion at the time about a fourth hurdle, that it was... Here we have a committee approving drugs, even if they were me too and very expensive and had no added benefit and were very expensive, but it was formally outside the remit of, in the Medicines Act. Um, you described um, in your statement, let me find the paragraph. But you will ask Professor Rawlings about that. Yes, you? absolutely. Um, uh, in your statement, I don't think we need to look at it, it's just a single sentence, you say that the medicines division was somewhat isolated yes. from the rest of the yeah. Department yeah. of Health. What, what was Very much so. It was in a separate building in, in Market Towers. Uh, because of the requirement for confidentiality under the uh, Section 118 of the Medicines Act, we couldn't really talk about what we were doing. Uh, we didn't mix with colleagues in the rest of the department. Uh, I, we, we were isolated. I had, I had almost, I don't think I would have recognised most of the, my fellow medics in the department, the other bit of the Department of Health at that time. And were the decisions of the subcommittees and the committee um, regarded as confidential because of issues relating to commercial sensitivity? Well, because of one, Section 118 of, of the Medicines Act required it to be confidential. So the work of the Medicines Division and the kind of issues that were being explored by the Medicines Division wouldn't at least as a matter of generality be shared with the remainder no, of the department? but when um, there was uh, an alert about an adverse reaction, for example, clearly we would at that stage be collaborating and, and cooperating with, with, uh, with colleagues. And there were some elements that um, impinged on the mainstream business of the uh, department. But for the day-to-day -day stuff, absolutely isolated. Um, now, if we then come to, to your time at the AIDS unit, which you joined in, in I think, May of 1986, it, the unit had already been established. Well, is that, is I that think your it was, I'm, I'm not sure when they started calling it a unit. Uh, it, it was a sort of a team within Med IMCD, uh, but I can't remember when they described it as a, as a, as a unit, basically. There were... A, a, a group of people who were working full-time on AIDS, put it that way. Um, and was the, the geographical jurisdiction of the AIDS unit, was that UK-wide? Um, I think Eager, Eager was UK-wide. I, I think it probably was, actually, yes. Um, and I don't think... Um, I mean, there would be some elements that would be handled by the territorial health departments, but... The major policy-making, decision-making was being done within the AIDS unit in collaboration with the other departments. Um, um, prior to your move to the AIDS unit, what was the, the, the state of your knowledge of, about AIDS? Not very much at all, I'm afraid. When I, I can remember when I was uh, transferred to the AIDS unit, my, my mother-in-law, who was, uh, had been involved in, in this, was... She was really rather horrified to find that I was going to go there and become Dr. Sibylis's boss. She, she, you know, she knew how little I knew, I think. Um, and I think you've said in your statement, uh, a publication such as the MMWRs yeah, you have, didn't see yeah. before you moved to the AIDS yeah. unit. Um, in terms of possible association between AIDS and blood, blood products, do you have any recollection of how and when you, that would have first um, I think it would have not hit my consciousness until the AIDS unit, to be honest. 
So it, it may or may not have been something you might have picked up from the media, but in terms of your yeah. own work, yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't something you had any knowledge of. You described the aid unit in your statement as small and exceptionally busy. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. what, what was its, what did you understand its role in remit to be? It, I guess we were providing um, advice principally to the chief medical officer and, and through him to, to the Department of Health and Social Security and government as a whole about how to deal with this, with, with AIDS. Um, I think I've also explained that we were not particularly concerned with blood and blood products because we had a group um, separate in the department handling that, but everything else was coordinated by the AIDS unit and uh, I think our agenda was determined really by the way events evolved and the way uh, the chief medical officer gave us direction under, under strong ministerial control. And although I talk about us providing policy for the Department of Health and other health departments and government as a whole, I think as we discovered, we were actually quite influential in providing policy for the world. Um, and I think it was said that we were further ahead in some of our political thinking of how to handle AIDS than other countries. And, uh, and we found that at the, the, the World Summit of Health Ministers on AIDS. And by the time you joined the AIDS unit, um, uh, in terms of screening of, of blood, that had, that had that's, already that taken had already place. Started. So you had no involvement with that no. decision-making process. Um, you've said in your statement the AIDS unit was nominally part of the MED IMCD division, but in practice it reported directly or you reported directly to the chief medical officer. Yeah, exactly. And was that a reflection of the fact that by 1986, at least, well, the chief medical officer was very much directly involved and engaged yeah. with the issue of AIDS? Yes, yeah. and, and I was a new appointment as well, so I wasn't replacing somebody else. It was part of his attempt to, to beef up the the AIDS response, bringing me in, and then actually it kept on growing and growing, and it then became o overwhelming in terms of the volume of activity. And I, need, I had a, 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 a superb grade seven working to, administrator working to me, but the, the answer was to bring in a, a joint head, uh, that's Alan Barton, to help me with the AIDS. And in terms of the kind <coughs> of initiatives and measures that the, that the AIDS unit looked at during the time you were there, um, was part and parcel of, of, of its role to think about steps that could be taken to prevent or reduce the spread of AIDS? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, what about the provision of information to the public about AIDS? Yeah, yeah it was all, pa all part of that. I think the assumption was if we, we, the public have to be properly informed about how the limited main ways that the AIDS virus was, was spread at HLV3 when I arrived. It got renamed during the time there. Um, so education was a, a really crucial part of it. Um, um, but because of the media interest, there was a lot of time as well with rumour busting, dealing with unhelpful media stories, silly media stories, and dealing as well with the stigma associated with infection of AIDS. And there was another side within the AIDS unit of of trying to predict and plan for services for people with AIDS. So it was the whole remit from you know, primary prevention through to, to treatment, terminal care, um, but in a very political and very media heavy environment. I, we were top of the government press cuttings list for several months daily. So a huge amount of press interest. Um, and as well as educating the public, did the AIDS unit consider it also had a role in relation to educating clinicians? Oh, very much so as well. Yeah, there are a series of, whole series of guidance documents, uh, some CMO letters, but particularly with professional bodies, um, uh, either departmental committees or subgroups of, of eager providing guidance, but also working with professional society providing their own guidance. Uh, and then um, you've mentioned eager, the expert advisory yeah. group on AIDS. You were... Um, Involved with EGO either as a member or as an observer right. from yes. 86 yeah. to 91. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, how often do, do you recall EGO meeting in, in board terms? I, I can't remember. I presume you've got copies of the, the minutes, which I 
I don't have. I, I think we, if we just go to one document and just get a sense of the membership. Again, again the decision to establish it had been taken before That's you right. became involved, I think. Yeah. Um, if we look at DHSC 0003711 underscore 105, please, Lawrence. Yeah, DHSC 0003711 underscore 105. So we can see the terms of reference at the top of the page um, to provide advice on such matters relate, uh, relating to AIDS as may be referred to it by the Chief Medical Officers of the Health Departments of the United Kingdom. So clearly it had an express UK-wide jurisdiction. Um, and then we can see if we look down the list, I don't need to go through the details of, of, yes, of everybody, yeah. but so right. there was, is this right, a, a fairly wide-ranging membership. Yeah, yeah, but it's also changed quite yes. a lot. People came and moved and... Uh, yes, and, we, and, we, and we, we can follow that through to the extent that we need to. I don't need to do yeah. with you through, through the minutes. Um, if, if we just go over the page... So this is the initial yeah. uh, setup, which was I never attended it when it was this group, this particular membership. Um, but was your experience of it that it, it reflected um, a range of different disciplines? It, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I was very surprised to look at these membership now because my recollection, when I, uh, you know, I haven't thought about it for, for 40 years, is that it, we also had lay members. And I thought Jonathan Grimshaw and from the Terence Higgins Trust, I sort of was expecting him to be there on the list. And we certainly had a lot more engagement with people of the affected communities at, at that time. For me, it was a culture shock, particularly when Donald Atchison was there chairing it, having come from a really rather structured and perhaps rather bureaucratic medicines division. When you look at the terms of membership, virtually everybody was a professor and frightfully eminent and to this, where it was a much more open discussion, much more engagement, talking about you know, some, some very delicate matters to do with you know, prostitution and, 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 and uh, sex and drug use and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, an, an interesting membership. I'd yes, this probably isn't the most relevant. This isn't the most relevant to my time. Yeah. Um, uh, and you, you've obviously had experience both before your work on the yes. AIDS unit through the Committee on the Safety of Medicines and afterwards involvement with um, SEAC and ACBSB yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. other committees. So you had a range of experiences with different committees. Was there anything particular about the eager that set it apart from any of the other committees that you, you had experience of? I, th I think probably its remit was wider and less structured so many of the other committees had much more restraining terms of terms of reference whereas I don't think there was any constraint on what eager could be discussing within the field of HIV AIDS uh, so it, it and, and I think some of the minutes that you've shared showed a large number of subcommittees and show the range of topics that they were having to uh, discuss so I think in that way it, it felt different from the ones that I've experienced before, very much so, but also substantially from the sort of committees I experienced later. Um, we, we talked about the confidentiality in relation to the Committee on the Safety of Medicines. Yes, that was we'll come on to confidentiality with ACBSB. What was the budget in, in relation to eager? do you recall? I, I can't remember. If, I mean, there may have been some medical incompetence matters being discussed, and we would obviously avoid mentioning names, but... At the time, there were some very unpleasant media campaigns about in, uh, infected healthcare workers. So that, putting that aside, that anything that might risk in, um, uh, identifying an individual would probably not come to, the, to, the, to, to eager. But I thought matters were in confidence, perhaps, but maybe not even that. I don't know. And I'll just have to look to see how the papers were marked. But uh, I think the whole ethos of... of of ego and, and AIDS was, was being open, and that was the, the route to um, preventing new infections, is sharing the, the, what we knew, but also what we didn't know, and uh, not hiding any of the really awful 
awful information that there was there. And, and at that time, you know, we, as far as we knew, everybody with AIDS was going to die, and the assumption was within two years. And, and you mentioned a moment ago, you mentioned it also in your statement, that um, the, uh, the, the AIDS unit, and I think you said eager, um, uh, had interaction with involvement with representatives, NGOs, um, or, or representatives in some way or another of, 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 of organisations or communities uh, in infected or affected. Yes. Yeah. Um, w was that, in your experience of, of, of the DHSS, unique? Did that happen with any of the other committees or decision making that you, you I, had involvement with? I don't know, but I'm assuming committees concerned with, say, diabetes would have very much have done it with the relevant society. So I don't know, but I, my assumption is it wasn't that unique. Um, but I think potentially this was a very policy heavy area. And, and perhaps that engagement was unique to that. Now, if, if we can then come to your work with MED SEB, mm -hmm. so from March 88 to June 1991, um, and I think you've told us MED SEB was then renamed yeah, ISD3 and then ISP3. Um, um, what was the, the jurisdiction, the remit of MED SEB as you understood it? I think it principally was concerned about pathology services, of which haematology was one subset. And do you recall who your predecessors were in your role? Um, well, I, I think it was Alice, Alison Smithies, but I think she must have had the entire remit. Um, but there was also a haematology SMO in post uh, who had just been appointed, uh, but didn't like the work and was leaving as I arrived, basically. Um, so the predecessor for the, the bit that I had to pick up, the haematology post, was somebody, was a new arrival who left within a few weeks. The predecessor for the, the higher level work, uh, as well as in practice much of the blood work, was Anderson Smithies. D D Dr. Raymond told us in relation to his own work yeah. um, that I in terms of files and documents, he would have his own files, yes. distinct yeah. from um, what he described as the official files exactly. held by the administrative yeah. branch. And he would have, he, th he thought, some of the material or, or, or equivalent papers of his predecessors. Yes. Do you recall whether you had papers that had been Dr. Smithers or, or, or Dr. Wolford's? Well, um, I don't know, but I, I could well have done. But he was absolutely right. I mean, the official files would have been held by the administrators. And uh, what I don't know is whether this, this, this uh, temporary hematologist, whether she, what she'd done with her files. But um, what I can say about files at that time, I don't know if you're, if you're interested, because when Dr. Raymond uh, just as Dr. Raymond left, I had a, another vacancy with another staff member, and the only real recollection I do have about files is uh, what to do with the files that had been left by uh, Mr. Peter Lister, who had been who was a retirement, and he was a senior principal scientific officer and been in post for many years, and had a room full of files, and he did not have a successor, and that was a vacancy that I had to cover, and I had filing cabinets full of files and I remember with my secretary going through that and um, arranging for most of them to be destroyed um, but I don't think we had many official files they would go to storage um, but after a career in, in the department you can imagine the amount of paperwork uh, a conscientious person can acquire and to be honest it's very difficult to then use those files if they're, if they're not part of the registered files if it's correspondence with somebody uh, about a topic five years ago, you might remember it, but it's highly unlikely a successor would, would know about it and know where to look. And it would be much better to rely on the official files to then trace back to the issue. So you, your role was, respon was responsibility for medical and scientific advice on pathology services. Right. That included haematology. Yes. Uh, what other types of services did it include? Well, uh, and this is relevant to, to the sort of the staffing structure we, we had. So essentially, it was a very small branch. Um, so there was a, should be an SMO dealing with haematology, one dealing with cytopathology and histopathology. So there were two medics. 
and then a scientist dealing with microbiology and another senior scientist dealing with clinical chemistry or bio biochemistry and also who ran the NEQUIS schemes. And then there was the anatomy inspector who technically couldn't be line managed because he was operating his own bit of legislation but was also for pan Russian purposes within the branch and then support staff. Um, and uh, you've told us when, when um, uh, you joined, or soon after you joined, the SMO with, with the haematology brief left. Yes. Uh, and it was about a year before Dr. Raymond exactly. took up the post. So in practice, you had to deal with the well, SMO to, haematology yeah, and, brief. And that, that's a consequence of the structure of the branch, is that I had, I had basically a branch of specialists, and it was very difficult to, uh, for them to do much to help me to cover that vacant work. So that was essentially spring 88 to spring 89. Exactly. And is that why, for example, we see you turning up at regional right. transfusion yeah. director meetings during yes. that period? Yeah. Um, now, during your time there, you were given your direct responsibility for the health aspects of BSE yes. by Donald Aitchison, yes. is that right? Yeah. And in practice, did that then, um, or to what extent did that take over your work? Well, I, I, I think I'll describe it fully in the BSE inquiry. Um, by uh, year by year, it was allocated only a small percentage of my time to start with. In practice, it became a, a, at least half half time, and sometimes it was almost full time. And it was, um, yeah, quite quite a, a challenge. So I had to fit that in together with uh, everything else. And in terms of line management, you reported to the CMO in relation to BSE, yes. but to the Deputy CMO, Dr. Metters, on other matters, including haematology. Yeah, in practice, that's what it was. There was an SPMO nominally in post, but um, some of the time, but that he was sort of not quite a gardening leave, but he was not playing an active part. Now, b by the time you took up that role in March 1988, mm. You'd have obviously built up a, 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 a fairly extensive knowledge in relation to AIDS. Yes. Yeah. Um, what about hepatitis? To what extent had that come across your desk? At I, I mean, I was not responsible for hepatitis, and I'm obviously as a result of this inquiry, I've been thinking, what did I know and think about hepatitis? <laughs> I, I guess, because of the work I was doing with in, injecting drug users, was very much aware of, of the problems of. of of uh, Hep B, uh, and also at that time, I think my assumption about non A, non B was that it can't be that serious because why was it so prevalent in Japan? And and also, actually, in relation to the population, I was particularly concerned about the drug users. They had such chaotic lifestyles; their life expectancy was so short. So, I can remember that that's why I was thinking probably early in my time in the AIDS unit, and I think that was probably consistent with more general views that non-A, non-B was not a terribly serious infection. Now, by the time I'd moved into the next post, I think the general knowledge about non-A, non-B had shifted, but also my knowledge had shifted, and I can't say when, but I certainly can remember thinking, we don't need to worry about this in relation to certain injecting drug users. So, um, where did responsibility for hepatitis sit within the department? That was another colleague in Med RMCD. I think it was probably Dr. Ray Penn at the time. Uh, it might, might have been somebody else, uh, but it's certainly at one time he was he was uh, a responsible person. Um, and then uh, in relation to the potential for transmission of, of hepatitis by by blood yes, and, that and blood be, products, would that sit within the haematology brief? Yeah, so that was with Alison Smithies and then it's the one that I would then acquired. Um. Um, now, the, the parallel administrative branch then um, was, I think, HS1, later renamed EHF1. That's right. So it was Malcolm Harris to start with and then Charles Dobson. Um, and then you say there was also the Medicines Division Biologicals, which would have had a role in relation then to the licensing. Yeah, so it was, I think throughout all this time, it was Francis Rockback with John, John Purvis on the pharmaceutical side. Uh, um, uh, and you've said, uh, in terms of some of the, the specific issues of relevance to the inquiry during this time, the impact of infection would have been something that fell broadly within med SEB and HS1. The litigation, the HIV litigation, would have been led by HS1 or EHS. With, with the solicitors. With the solicitors, but then with medical input 
Yes. Um, and, and, and obviously we heard from Dr. Raymond about that. Uh, and the financial assistance schemes were the responsibility, or the primary responsibility of HS1 slash EHF1. Yeah. But again, with medical input as, as and when required. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I just ask you if we look at your statement, if we have the statement back on screen, please, Lawrence. So WITN 69650001. Um, uh, picking up on page 13, please, bottom of page 13. You were asked here about the roles played by the various different mm. divisions, Med IMCD, Med SCB, Med ISP. Um, and if we go over the page, and to top of page 14, you've described Med IMCD as a division, Med SCB as a Branch. Um, can you just help us understand what, what the distinction was there? Well, a branch was a sub, subset of a division, but some, like MedSEB, might not then have reported to within a division. And I think the easy thing to do is just look at some organograms of the department at various times. It's, it was very difficult to describe, and, and, and frankly, since I've wrote this, I, I realise a lot of it's in the BSE inquiry report, it gives you organograms of various periods, and you'll see it's actually quite difficult to describe. Now you've told us how the medicines mm. division essentially worked in isolation from the yes. rest of the yeah. department. What about, um, the, whether they were divisions or branches, um, the different teams, if I can put it that way, um, involved here? What, what, what was the extent, if any, of the communication between them? Um, it depends which, which teams are you talking about. The AIDS unit within with SEB or SEB with with others. Or? Um, um, SEB with others, for example, um, uh, um, the extent of communications with Med IMCD or with. Well, certainly, uh, depending on the the topic in question, we deal with the relevant individual in the in the department. And it doesn't sound to be bureaucratic. It wouldn't. Sort of, do it through division. You do it at a cross level at whoever was the appropriate person. And frankly, I wouldn't actually think about the division other than checking my secretary put the right uh, letters after their name in the uh, uh, in the memo. Um, so if you if if you or Dr. Raymond had needed to know something more about hepatitis, um, it would be a question then of contacting the individual who yes. held the SMO brief for hepatitis. If he if he needed to, yes. Um, and, and then in your statement just a little further down the page you've talked more generally about the I I issues of communication yeah. communications by minutes personal meetings phone conversations sharing of documents and, and then you said this in 8.2 sometimes this process worked very well but often less so for example yes. when the internal expert was not recognized because yeah. outside the familiar and regular group of contacts what, what did you mean by well, that well i um I th think that on several occasions, conscious that a policy may have been developed or being developed, and we realised too late that we should have included somebody on the management executive side or a colleague in, in finance or somebody on research and development. It was, we'd have our regular working links and that's fine, and then late thought, ah, of course, so-and-so has an interest. And it's quite complicated because the department you know, went very wide, um, and what I say here is because I was in the AIDS unit, I had had to interact with large parts of the department, but it was not very easy. You didn't have a searchable database, and that's why I remember Norman Hale was one of my administrative colleagues at the grade three level. He was superb. He was just a, a, a walking database. He would automatically know who needed to know about something. Um, and then um, we can take the statement down, thank you. Do you know why it took so long to fill the vacant haematology SMA? Well, on the whole, uh, it wasn't just vacant haematology posts, I'm afraid. The Department of Health was not regarded as a, an employer of choice for many doctors. It was, um, the salaries weren't particularly competitive. Um, but in your working life as a doctor, you get thanked several times. Oh, thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. You get a lot of instant reward. It was a, a bit of a shock to go from that sort of environment into an office environment where you're, you're handling bits of paper in the formal meetings. It essentially 
spending a lot of time being a bureaucrat and very uncomfortable for many active clinicians. Uh, but if people didn't have a clinical background, they were of less value in the department. Um, and some, like this, this hematologist, came and found it, it was not for her. Um, so I don't think hematology in particular was the problem. I think it was across the board, the amount of vacancies, which of course is a bit, bit of a joke, really, because they always were trying to reduce the numbers of staff. But they didn't like some of the ones they had, um, but couldn't get um, uh, fresh blood in. Um, can I turn into the role of the chief medical officer? Your time at the department spans, um, I think, three, three chief yes. medical officers, Henry Yellowlees, Donald Dixon, Kenneth Coleman. Um, you've said in your statement you don't recall meeting don't Henry Yellowlees other than at large staff group meetings. I might have done I might not even done that. I, I don't remember. Um, well, it, 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 is that telling in itself? Was he a Well, I've seen what other people have said about him, but, yeah, I think. Uh, an accurate reflection, shall we say. Um, you described... Um, so don't but, but also, to be honest, because in the medicines division, we wouldn't have expected to see the chief medical officer. You, you described um, Sir Donald as, as exceptional in recognising and dealing with AIDS and, and BSC. Yeah. Um, but I think it would be right to understand your, your knowledge of his involvement really begins from May of 1986 when you joined the AIDS unit. So you yes, I, he, he'd asked to see me, if, if, I suppose, a few weeks before, and I didn't know quite why. Um, there was some excuse about a, a, a paper I'd, I'd written really about the fourth hurdle, about ways of, of uh, which was quite out of order, I shouldn't have been writing it. And I wondered why he'd wanted to see me, but uh, I think uh, as a result of that meeting, I, next thing I know, I was, I was posted. So I, I think it's right, you can't help us with understanding how engaged the chief medical officer or indeed the deputies were with the issue of AIDS in 82, 83, 84, I can't 85. from any direct experience, but what I can say is from my experience of him at the time of BSE, he was on the ball instantly. You know, within minutes of hearing of the problem, he was uh, activating um, ex external advice and, and so on. So at least for that, al that health alert, he was completely um, up to speed straight away and, and way ahead of the game. You know, he was the first to recognise the problem. Now, we, we, we've heard reference... Um, in, in earlier evidence, and, and you've referenced it yourself, to the role of the consultant advisors to yes, the chief medical yeah. officer. And I think we pick up from the, the documents there were some 80 or so consultant advisors to the chief medical were officer. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to uh, um, uh, blood, yes. it, it was, I think, during your time in med SEB, it would still have been Dr. Gunster. Absolutely, and I relied on him really heavily, being a non hematologist. Um, you know, I, I was going to him all, all the time, and he was very generous with his time. So you had, as it were, direct access to Dr. Gunson. You yes. could pick up the phone to him. I did indeed. Yes. Um, can I then just explore with you a little uh, the, the 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 role of the chief medical officer in terms of providing guidance, advice, and information? And perhaps we could start by doing it through the BSC inquiry report. Um, Lawrence, can we have MHRA 0031996, please? And if we go to page 36, um, we can see uh, halfway down the page there a description of the, the chief medical, the chief medical officer. Yes. officer. Um, so if we just, um, I think, pick it up at the bottom of the page, paragraph 4.19, um, we see it, it being said that Sir Donald told the BSC inquiry that the Chief Medical Officer is the Principal Advisor on Medical and Public Health Matters, not only to ministers in the Department of Health, but to the... Government. Go to the top of the next page. Ministers in other government yes, departments exactly. and to the government as a whole. Um, and then... Um, it said that unlike the chief veterinary officer, the chief medical officer did not have oversight of an executive organisation. Can you just, are you able to explain that distinction to us? Don't worry if you're not. I don't know, but it may have been the, uh, some of the, the veterinary labs and things that the chief veterinary officer had responsibility for. In any event, we then see that the chief medical officer's observation 
Um, while the CMO may offer guidance on medical or public health matters to all doctors or to directors of public health, yeah. neither he nor his predecessors have had a management line or any power of direction to doctors outside the, the Department of Health. Now, is, is this, does this reflect your understanding? Yes, so you, yeah. The Chief Medical Officer couldn't, didn't manage he didn't, the medical he, profession. He, the, the people he managed were, at that time, were managing essentially the medical hierarchy within the department. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm remembering now the Chief Veterinary Officer had various in, in, uh, inspectorates and things that he, he managed. Um, and I think it's a, what I you know, described to other people how, what the management line is in the NHS. And I think I'm surprised that actually there's no management line over GPs. They're independent contractors. And as a director of public health, I found there was only influence and maybe restricting what we would fund as the only way of, of influencing what general practitioners did. So there was an absence of the sort of management you might have expected, even down at a, a local level. Um, but whilst the Chief Medical Officer then didn't have any management responsibility in that sense, yeah. he, he did have a essentially un, un, unfettered power to provide guidance on medical or public health matters. Is, is, um, I don't know how un, unfettered it would be to be a, in practice. Can I put it this way? A wide power? Yeah, he would have a wide power, yes. Um, um, uh, and then we can see uh, 4.22 says, as, as well as having responsibility for yeah. medical and public health advice, the yeah. CMO yeah. was charged with ensuring yes. that an adequate quality of advice was provided yeah. within DH by its professional staff. So yeah. that's the, the line management exactly. responsibility for the yeah. medical officers yes. within the department. Um, uh, and then uh, just reading down the page, please, if we see the last two paragraphs. Um, so 4.23 describes the CMO as occupying a senior position within the medical profession nationally, holder, uh, sorry, member of key government and professional committees, responsible for maintaining links at the highest level between the government and the medical profession nationally with colleagues in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, and then represents the UK within the European community and within yeah. the wider international field. Uh, and then 4.24, as the nation's doctor issuing guidance to the public on a wide range of health and related lifestyle issues, CMO was expected to produce an annual um, report on the state of public health to highlight major issues where health has improved and where there's concern about health. So um, is, is this fair in, in terms of your own understanding? Yes. A, a, again, a, a wide power both to provide guidance, well, um, um, well. obviously as, a, as they consider appropriate, to, to, to doctors, but also um, a remit in terms of the provision of information more generally to the public about, about public health matters? Um, I think he, he, yes, whether he would choose to exercise those powers, I don't know. And I don't know what constraints there were in terms of the, the, the financial consequences of providing advice, just the logistics, basically. Um, but when it came to, to AIDS, I mean, clearly he was advice was being given to, to the whole population at a cost of uh, tens of millions of pounds. Um, and then I don't need to, to take you to it, but the reference to the 80 consultant advisors, I knew I'd got it from somewhere, and it's paragraph 4.26 on the following page, but um, I, don't, I don't need to take you to that. Um, if we then um, go back to your witness statement, please, WYTN 69650001. And go to page 16. I just wanted to pick up at paragraph 11.2, again on the same issue of guidance from chief medical officers. You say this, the chief medical officer would write in frequently to some yes. or all doctors yeah. on specific issues, usually in relation to public health, um, and then uh, you say you don't have a, an archive of those, that's, that's fine. No. Um, among these were letters about AIDS, including advice that specific consent and counselling was needed when testing for HGLV3 yes. slash HIV. Uh, and then you've given a, 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 an example, which was CMO 87.5. Um, you, you said the CMO would write infrequently. Yes. Was there any, as far as you know, any, any rule of thumb that the CMO felt that he 
should only issue a certain number of, 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 of letters or pieces I, of advice? It depends who he was writing to. And I, can I slightly correct what Dr. Raymond suggested in his evidence that it had to go to all doctors? It didn't have to go to all doctors. There were selective copy lists. But the ones that went to all doctors, he had to choose very carefully. And I think the feedback he was getting from the general practitioners is basically he had to be not to overwhelm them. They had so much that else they had to do that if he didn't choose wisely on the topics that were of, of that was he wrote to them about, then he would switch them off. Basically, not only they wouldn't have time to look at it, but they'd be very negative about the really important ones they did receive. So the ones that went to all general practitioners, all doctors, had to be chosen very, very carefully, and there was quite a barrier to get them accepted by the chief medical officer. Uh, really, because he had they. They were very precious and had to be saved for the really, really important topics. And that's why the, a listing would be quite helpful. And I know that I got, when I was in the AIDS unit, I got a disproportionate number of, of CMO letters because of his interest. And I think I had colleagues complaining that they couldn't, they couldn't get letters on their topics sent out. Um, so but a listing would be helpful. Um, and so then in, in, in terms of uh, letters uh, that wouldn't go to all doctors, but yeah. might go to, to select groups of doctors, presumably that could reflect particular areas of medical, yes, di yeah. some med are medical discipline. Hospital doctors, sometimes to paediatricians, sometimes psychiatrists. Uh, and there were a parallel lot of letters by the chief nursing officer and the chief pharmaceutical officer and the chief dental officer. And, and do you remember at all the extent to which any of the, the royal colleges played any particular part in... Um, in, or, or interaction with the Royal Colleges played any particular part in the work of the, the Chief Medical Officer, Deputies, or, or the Principal well, Medical Officer? Um, I, well, I think individual Royal Colleges, Presidents would have uh, a direct line with the, the, the Chief Medical Officer and probably the Deputy Chief Medical Officer as well, so there was a lot of dialogue of that sort. Um, there was a Standing Medical Advisory Committee, which was a rather more formal body with all presidents of the Royal Colleges round the table, chaired by the Chief Medical Officer, and that would be the formal forum at which he would have an interaction with them. But on a one-to-one -one basis, I think he would be very familiar with all the, all the presidents. So if, and, and this, is, this is absolutely a yeah. hypothetical question, not, not yeah. relating to any particular topic, but if, if there was an issue that was of concern to the Chief Medical Officer or, or flagged up to him by one of his deputies, yeah. um, and there was a question mark over, you know, was this something for yes. a for a dear, dear doctor letter to everyone, or, or could it be dealt with in another way? There was nothing that would prevent a dialogue taking place with perhaps a relevant Royal College and exploring whether there were different ways of getting that information yeah, either out there. Yeah, either to the present Royal College, but also there were specialist societies, you know, um, British Society of Gastroenterology, say. So, it, you know, there were, uh, there were a whole range of medical bodies, um, and, uh, yeah, who, who, who uh, would know the best way to get information out to those who needed to know. Um, and then, can, can I just explore with you a little more what you say in paragraph 11.3 of your statement? So, bottom of this page and, and, and then top of the next. So, you yeah. say this in relation to guidance on clinical management on any or all of these topics, I'm not sure this should be the CMO's role. And traditionally, frontline clinicians would not yes. have taken kindly to have been told how to manage their patients by a distant bureaucrat, even one as eminent as the CMO. Decisions needed to be local to the patient when it was more a question yeah. of optimising rather than banning treatment. In the areas of specific concern to the inquiry, there was, on top of the next page, oh. often scope for genuinely yeah, justifiable yeah. exceptions to what might be best practice overall, meaning that there could not be hard and fast yeah. rules to be policed by others like the pharmacy. Clinical freedom enabled advances to be made, but also enabled others to fail to keep up with best practice. Now, I'll, sure. I'll come back to the concept of clinical freedom and its role okay, in, right. in, in a few minutes, if I may. But um, wh why was it that, the, you, that your view, as expressed in that, in that paragraph, was that when we were talking, if you're talking about clinical management, there was less of a role for the chief medical officer? I don't think he really saw that in his remit. Um, uh, indeed, someone like Donald Etchison had not been a hands-on clinician for a, for a long time. Um, he would only be then passing on advice and information he'd got from specialists in the field, 
and it would have more weight and be more relevant if it came from those specialists. Um, so if there's a particular problem, let's take gastroenterology to be way outside of terms of reference your inquiry. It would be much better if it came from the relevant president of the college or the Br British Society, and that's their peer group and would influence clinical management much more effectively. Um, so again, uh, if we take a, a hypothetical example, yeah. um, um, le let's say um, the, the relevant medical branch or division with, within the department had a concern, or a deputy chief medical officer, chief medical officer, had a, had a concern about whether a cohort of patients were being given um, uh, proper information uh, or in, 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 on something which was a, an emerging risk or a new and developing field. Now, obviously, no, no one would suggest that it was the role of the chief medical officer to determine um, exactly what Dr. Smith should say to, to patient Jones on an individual basis in the consulting room. But in terms of that, that a general concern about the extent to which information was about new risks was properly understood, properly being disseminated, how might that kind of problem, how could it have been addressed by the department or by the CMO? Yeah, well, again, I think this was changing during my time in the department, and certainly by the time I left, there was much more direct engagement with the patient associations. So in that sort of topic, you'd assume that it would be a specialist patient association would be in direct di dialogue with the, the policy people and be through them. By the time when I started in the AIDS unit, I think that was rather less, less usual. So that's why my engagement with the Terence Higgins Trust seemed to be a, a, a bit of a, a shock and, a, and different from what was happening elsewhere in the department, but very much encouraged by Donald Aitchison, the engagement of patients throughout. More difficult if there isn't a direct patient association. Um, so I'm sorry, I slightly lost the, the have I answered the question? Yes, yeah, no, I think that I'm just exploring with you, for, really for your how observations, yeah. yes. how, um, what, what ways there might have been yeah. of dealing then with also through the specialist that. associations and so on. Um, if it was thought that was an um, appropriate thing to, to be said, but I mean, how you'd express it to expert group of clinicians that, by the way, you're not telling your patients enough, um, that would have to be handled rather delicately. Um, and then if we look at, sorry, um, um, Lawrence, if we can have, oh no, it's still on screen, thank you. Paragraph 11.4, so the next one. Um, yeah. You've said there, how best to change attitudes and behaviour was a more general concern in DH with information, education and frequent prompts found useful. There were many examples where some clinical practice failed for years to keep up with emerging uh, evidence. And then you give, give, give a little more, more detail about that. Um, uh, do you, you've, you've given an example there in relation to um, tonsillectomies, but yeah. do, do you recall any other particular concerns? Uh, was it more well, of there, there were a general? large number of, of areas where people were not hadn't kept up with the times in right across areas of, of clinical practice. And when I talk about um, devices to restrict what was fundable, I think around this sort of time, the prop list came in, and for the first time, GPs could prescribe what they wanted to, of course, but actually only a limited range of medicines were fundable, refundable on the NHS. And that caused an enormous amount of stir about restricting the clinical freedom of, of GPs. Um, so, uh, you know, and some of, the, some of the drugs that GPs were wanting to prescribe, that there'd been professional advice given to them for years and years and years about them being inappropriate. And if I can just pick up the penultimate sentence of that paragraph, you say, so when guidance right. on clinical practice was needed, it was more effective for this to yeah, be delivered exactly. as a consensus through professional bodies, or with even greater clout of all the medical defence bodies. Yeah. Now, leave aside medical defence bodies for a moment. In terms of the delivery as a consensus through professional bodies, um, that, that sounds as though it might be a a more longer-term exercise, a potentially a slower process? No, not, not necessarily. The Royal General Practitioners would, um, uh, and, and indeed through some of the, uh, their, their, their local groups and the, the, the BMA would 
uh, um, act very quickly, and uh, some of the other professional societies who act quickly, they have their own journals, uh, uh, a journal like Pulse, which went out to all GPs, they, they're more likely to read that more quickly uh, and more regularly than any letter from the chief medical officer. Um, so, so. It, 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 is, is this right, the right to understand that if we're looking at the, 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 the ways in which the Department of Health might might influence yes. clinicians, one shouldn't just think in terms of the dear doctor letters. There Absolutely might be a range not. of different ways. Much range better ways through, through other ways. Um, uh, just, can I just pick up in relation to the medical defence bodies? Yes. Was, was giving guidance on, on clinical practice really part of their role? Yes, yeah, they want, I mean, particularly dang, about dangerous practice, they would send you around sort of horror stories of, of how, you know, re recent cases they've been involved with and. Um, uh, and warnings about, you know, properly documenting what you've said and watching about the, uh, the, uh, um, yeah, well, that's enough said. But, I mean, you can look at the, the sort of communications they did with their, with their doctors. Uh, you, and you've told us about the, 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 the dialogue that there might be between the CMO or department and, and, the, and the professional bodies. What was there, as it were, an ability to, to, to pick up the phone or have a meeting with the, the medical defence unions or I, CMA? I don't know. I, ne I never did. But it might have been at the management executive side, depending on... I mean, they would have a joint interest with the NHS in reducing any dangerous practice, basically. Um, shame we didn't ask Dr Walford that. She would have, I'm sure, been able to answer. Um, can, we can take the statement down. Thank you, Lawrence. Can I then just come more broadly um, to relationships with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland? Yes. Um, to what extent did you have dealings with colleagues in the relevant part of the Welsh Office, the Scottish Home and Health Department, the um, Department of Health um, Northern Ireland? Um, well, I think I had... I th well, I've seen what, or heard what Dr Raymond um, said. I, I guess I had slightly more involved, but it depended and it varied according to the time period I was concerned with. In medicines, it was um, the Section 4 committees were for all health departments. We had representatives from what we would describe as the Celtic fringe, which is slightly unfair, uh, were present at the time, so we didn't have to have any communications with them at all. Within AIDS, and eager they may have had members there, but they obviously didn't have the capacity to develop policy in the way that we did. Um, my experience was the Northern Ireland group was very, very small and were so grateful for anything we could uh, do on their behalf and, and were lapped up what we said. The Welsh were also mostly passive. The Scottish were a, a, a bigger group uh, within um, the Scottish Home and Health Department and sometimes there was a more distinct Scottish angle, partly because the legislation was different. And there were some problems like the injecting drug use was greater um, up in Scotland. Um, what else was When you so, were at SCB in particular, what were yeah, you? Yeah, um, I mean, they, they were clearly present, or had the scope to have a, a representation on ASVCB, but um, I, f I fear, although they were present at those meetings, during some of the other policy development, sometimes, oh, we must tell Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. It was a sort of, often, in, maybe not so much in that time period, in other time periods, they were a regretful late thought. We only remember them rather late in the process, so we occasionally get grumbles back that I wish they'd heard earlier. But I think for the blood side, they were probably plugged in rather better than actually in any of the other time periods. And can you remember by name any individuals you dealt with in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland on any issue relating to blood and blood products? Is it McIntyre? I don't know. What, you'll have to remind me. Come uh, on. The, 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 it's 40, hand, 40 years ago. The, 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 uh, there are a handful of documents, I think, yes, in the yeah. exchanges between you and Dr McIntyre. Uh, uh, it's really a question. Are there any other names that come to mind? Uh, that nothing comes document? to mind, but if I looked at the documents, things could be triggered. Um, um, so I'm going to move on. And the chief medical officer in, in Scotland occasionally, and, and obviously when it was Ken Calman, that was very, uh, very helpful. Because he had occupied that role previously in Scotland. Yes, yeah, but he, uh, yes, but he was also engaged in Ego as CMO Scotland. So. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move on to another uh, topic. So perhaps the permanent, perfect moment for the morning break.
Uh, yes, well, well, we shall take a break until uh, quarter to 12. Now, Thank you. Um, you, you may have heard me say yeah. Yeah. before, or you don't have to say now, yeah. uh, you mustn't talk about anything that you've been asked about in evidence or anything you think you might yeah. be uh, with anyone, whoever that anyone is, but you can talk about anything else you like. Will do. Quarter to twelve.